Um, now regarding the progress of the hackathon, this time we will do it a bit differently than, than, than the previous days. So instead of going through the hackathon teams, we will have a more in-depth discussion about the um, hackathon modules team, which was led by Harshil. And there were a lot of uh, developments in this team during this hackathon. So that's why we want to present this time some slides and discuss more in detail on what have been the processes there in the um, um, NFCO modules and DSL2 team. So please, Harshil, whenever you're ready, we can share the slides. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I've just asked Paolo to join. <laughs> um, <clears throat> would someone mind sending him the link to, um, to the Zoom session? Because I don't think he's on here. I'll sort out the slides. Um. Everyone see that? Yes, perfect. Right, so is Paolo on? Don't think so. I don't see him in the participant list. Okay, so maybe we can ta start talking about some other stuff that may not need Paolo involved, I guess. Um, Another option is we could always do the wrap up from the other tool. Are they, did you see we we're going to do other wrap ups at all, or just quickly for the other groups? Um, as there were no volunteers for the wrap up this time, and some groups were mentioning that there were not uh, a lot of developments, I thought we can move directly to the wrap up for the modules and DSL2 hackathon project. Yeah. Okay, so. I think this stuff all requires Paolo's input. So maybe if we um, if we start with this. Uh, so the idea here is basically to discuss amongst us um, little niggly things that have come up over the past few days with DSL2, uh, and maybe to try and nail down nail down some um, some ways of dealing um, with these things. And I guess um, it. <sighs> I think we've gone some way in now getting together something that works uh, with the simple fast QC example. Uh, but I think we may still need to refine the design before we start mass producing modules. Otherwise, we're just going to have to submit loads of pull requests to update everything. Um, and so it might make sense to just think about things in a bit more detail before we do that. Um, and that's exactly what this is about. So uh, this, I believe, came from Gregor uh, and uh, the the question here is, do we have um, several containers for each sub command of a particular tool? So bed tools, as you know, has multiple um, has multiple commands, and do we build separate containers for that, or do we have a clever way somehow of just referencing, say, for example, a main bed tools container that we can use? Any thoughts or comments on that? Gregor, are you here as well? Maybe you can just unmute and chat. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah, so I have a few thoughts about it. So <clears throat> the one thing is that um, yeah, having different versions sounds ugly and it could possibly happen somehow that in, within the same pipeline, we use different versions of the same tool, which we absolutely don't want. On the other hand, it could just make things more complicated because the continuous integration is 
coded to like check a whole module and build the container for it. So it could just be more streamlined to have the environment file within each module. I can just chime in. Uh, I, I completely agree. I, I think both would work, but uh, I think although it's messier, it'd actually be simpler to keep each of these as isolated modules with as few dependencies outside of that directory as possible. So my, my gut feeling is to say just everything has its own Docker image and its own Honda environment. Okay, so so do we do we name these containers bed tools uh, underscore subcommand or do we name them just bed tools under the domain tool? Because I mean, they, are there likely to be clashes that way in, in terms of how these containers are built? Yeah. Um, so Gregor and I have been talking a bit about how we pin the code. Uh, so if, when you define process.container, you need to pin a, a Docker um, version. And we don't have versions in NF core modules, we just have commit hashes. And yeah. you don't get that commit hash until after you've committed your code. So it's impossible to use the git hash in the code, if that makes sense. Yeah, It's a bit of a catch-22 situation. So uh, Gregor's suggestion, which I think is really good, is we use a hash um, a file hash of the um, the Docker file and the environment file, and if those two are identical, then you'll end up with an identical container, um, which actually maybe is not such a bad thing. But we I, and we could also add other things into that hash. For example, we could add the file path into the hash, which would then make it unique. Um, so they shouldn't clash, but we need to be a bit careful about it, I guess, um, if we use the same name, because as long as we have that tag there. But it might be safer to use underscore subcommand. It would certainly be a bit clearer to use because I can also imagine that some subcommands might need other tools in them and some, so they might not be the same. So for example, if you're using BWA to index, you probably don't need SAM tools. But if you're doing BWA, BWA to align, then you probably do want SAM tools. So you don't want to call both of those containers the same thing when they're different. Yeah, good point. But that does mean, I guess, on the downside there is that we'll be downloading loads of containers, right? Or more than yeah. we need. Um, yeah, I think it. Yeah, I think it may make sense possibly to to even throw in the um, the main.nf of the module file within that hash um, to, I guess, make things even more unique than just using the Docker file and the environment file because the code in that will be different across subcommands anyway, right? Yeah, that would work. Yeah. Okay, cool. So On the other hand, it would lead to the fact that we rebuild the Docker container even if just a, a comment was fixed in the next flow script. Ah, good point. Yeah, so then you can use the, the path if you want. Yeah. To the Docker file. Okay, we can figure that. I, I guess, so So the, the solution here is then just to go for separate Docker images, right? Okay, cool. Um, there are a couple of things in the comments. Um, a couple of votes for having a single container because it's um, tidier, which I, I agree with it's tidier, but it's just where it causes problems. Uh, and Steve saying that he's come out, got around the hard coded hash thing by having separate repositories. So have this one repo for containers and one repo for modules, uh, which yeah, definitely does allow you to get around the issue. But then you have two repos to maintain separately. <laughs> and keep in sync. Yeah. yeah, I think the idea here is for us just to try and um, make things as easy as, po as, as encapsulated as possible, possible per module, I think. Um, it would be nice to, to have it in this way if we can. But I also do get the point about having one container but maybe for, for starts now, we just um, go with uh, separate containers. And then if we can find a clever way to maybe, I don't know, you know, maintain one container per tool, then we can implement that at a later date maybe. All right, so. So just a couple of questions about bio containers. Tell me if this is annoying me butting in with questions. Left. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> uh, so the question's about whether we should, why, why can't we use bio containers? Um, and is that not better, seeing as we're using Condo anyway? Uh, it's a really good question. Originally, we were planning to use bio, bio containers for everything. Um, we hit some issues, though. Um, we found it was difficult to make multi um, 
software containers, for example, for WMM and SAM tools in the same container. Um, so that should be fixable. Um, so we're going to hopefully have a talk from Jern uh, tomorrow about exactly this. Um, and you can kind of imagine quite a few times where it, we might need more than one one tool in there or other kind of weird stuff. And the other thing is just like not having control of the build, um, which again just makes it harder to fix things if we need to update the packages which are in the container or if a certain tool needs a, something weird in there which prior containers doesn't have. Uh, you don't have control over it. Whereas if we're building all of the containers ourselves, we can guarantee that they're stable and that they work and we can fix them whenever we want. So I'm a bit split on it. I still think it'd be really nice just to use by containers. Um, but we kind of said recently for at least to start off with, we just do our own thing. Uh, and if later on we decide that by containers works then we can always switch to that and stuff and holding stuff to it. So perhaps one more comment on, on that uh, right here. Uh, I guess it's a good point to have the procedure properly established for, for building a container. Uh, and then you can perhaps rely on bio containers and just uh, you know a pointer to the bio containers, uh, to, to a bio container in, uh, in most cases. Um, and then, but have the automation in place uh, to build if that is not provided. Or even, you know, the simple build could be could be just a from bio containers, like just you know, a single line um, Docker file. Yeah, I think I think that partly makes sense as well. So at the moment, I guess what what we could do for now, maybe, um, is possibly so. For example, at the moment, we still need to figure out all of this versioning with FastQC and stuff. So um, I guess in the interim for now, we could point to a bio container which is working, which allows us to test things um, using Docker and Singularity and stuff until we've, so we, maybe we could take the flip approach, um, use bio containers for now until we've figured out how to um, do things in a more stable manner um, in terms of us customizing the, the Docker builds and stuff. Um, what do you think about that, Phil? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know really. I, I basically I can see arguments for everything. Um, my all the way through NF4 modules are so many choices to be made at every point. My gut feeling at the moment is do everything ourselves and keep everything super simple uh, to start off with, um, and then I don't know. It's tricky. Yeah, I don't have a strong opinion either way on, on the containers really. I guess, I guess one of the downsides of doing it that way is that you can have um, version mismatches in the bio container and the Conver environment uh, if we're planning on using both. Um, unless we lint for this specifically somehow, uh, you could end up pulling Samtools version 1.8 as a bio container and have 1.9 in the environment and then you've got version mismatches across your sort of software. Um, which isn't ideal, could still, you know, things will still work, but it's probably not ideal to have it in that way, I guess. Um, yeah, any more thoughts on that from anyone? Just unmute and, 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 and chime in. Um, Francesco here, I'm not sure if anybody is ever gonna run into a storage or space problem, obviously, because <clears throat> having one container per sub command uh, will obviously generate a huge number of containers, which might then you run into the problems you were mentioning, controlling that they are the same version. So potentially there might be different versions per sub command. So in, personally, I would, I would prefer the container per tool rather than sub command, but I, I, I see absolutely the point of versioning control what what happens in in each module that is organized by sub command so i, I don't really have <laughs> i like feel i think I, I can see the pros and cons in both approaches in general i would prefer to have less potentially identical containers because that's what you might end up with if you, following the discussion of the other day about having always the latest version potentially the containers of all sub commands would be 
exactly identical. Just to, yeah. to clarify, having version mismatches across different subcommands, that's possible even if you use the same container name, because it will be accessing specific container hashes for each subcommand. So if you pulled in different versions of those, those modules, different versions of the subcommands, they'll hard code different tags. So even if it's the same container name, they'll be pulling in different tags. So <clears throat> sharing an image across different bed tool subcommands, for example, doesn't avoid the issue of having <coughs> different versions of the software. That's up to the pipeline developer to avoid. Uh, but yeah, I agree for file size, it maybe maybe we just do, do what you suggest, Ash, or just have one called. We have a Docker file, an environment file in every single subcommand, but we call it, if it's just got bed tools in it, we call it bed tools and we use the hash of the Docker file and the environment file. And then if all of those three subcommands have the same conda file, the same Docker file, they'll end up with the same name and the same hash. And so they will all share the same container, even though they're all building that container. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a good solution. Okay, cool. Yeah, that does that does make sense. Um, yeah, so we in the end we would only end up with one bed tools container because each subcommand would be building the same container, and so um, it won't be rebuilt with those unique hashes, right? Yeah. Cool. Exactly. And if you want to have uh, BWA and some tools, you call it BWA some tools. Yeah. We need to. The only thing is, we need to store somewhere what the image will be called. Yeah. Exactly. So the, we can, I'm sure we can get around that. Yeah. So the way we approach it now then, I guess, is if you have a module for, BW, for bed tools merge, then um, the name of the container is actually bed tools and not bed tools underscore merge. If you, just likewise, if you have a, um, a module for bed tools sort, the name of the container is bed tools and not bed tools underscore sort. And ideally that, that, will, that will work in, in this context that we're talking about. And we'd only have one container, which is great. Cool. Anyone else? Anything else to say? Right. Gregor, do you want to jump in here? I think you made these slides, right? Yeah. So um, I was wondering about the metadata the documentation, which we now have in form of YAML files. And I find them a bit complicated, and I was wondering if we can simplify them. Because now, if we have this input, which basically has two input channels, one the tuple, foo, and bar, and the second one with the um, bass, we would have this nested list in YAML, which yeah looks ugly and is probably hard to maintain, which has the first channel and the two um, items in the tuple, and the second channel, channel listed separately. And yeah. If you go to the next slide, I was wondering that one option could be, Harshil, can you go to the next slide please? Yeah, um, that we just make a flat list because the input name is unique already anyway. So we wouldn't necessarily have to split it up into the different channels. Or if we maybe could come up with something more doc string like, which is on the next slide that we basically have the documentation and the, the code together. And yeah, here I mocked some sort of Java doc-like approach, but it could be whatever that we declare the inputs, the type, the name, and the short description at in a comment close to where the channels are actually defined. I think we talked about this way back after ISMB last year when we created the NF Core modules repo. So um, Sven and I were in Switzerland uh, and we got inspired to start dealing with all of this stuff. And I think we had some conversations with Phil at the time as well. So I think issue number one on the modules repo is actually for documentation. Um, and I think we, we did propose something like this at the time as well, but then the, I can't remember why we rejected it. Phil maybe can remember, but I think it was more the ability to easily parse and use the documentation downstream was the argument we went for. Um, but I can't, Phil, do you remember what we, why we decided that? Yeah, I remember the conversation. I remember exactly this suggestion because it does feel very elegant to write it in line. And I think it was what you said that just having a YAML file you can dump into other tools is a bit easier. 
rather than having to like pass through and pull all these out. But I don't really remember to be honest. If I, I can say something here. So actually I'm already using this metadata documentation in, in, in some in projects that, uh, that I have because I copied it from the, when I was in the, in the hackathon in, in London. And I think it's, it's cool to have the YAML because it gives, so you can parse it easily. And, and then for instance, if not only for documentation, but if, I don't know, for instance, in the future, you can, you want to automatize the connection of the models. So for instance, you can create a tool to kind of create of uh, link some models together and, and create the pipeline automatically. The, the YAML can, can be more useful for, for this kind of, of things, but. Yeah, I think I think that's basically why we decided to go with a separate document. Um, at the time, I think I was I was pushing to have it in the same document like you, Gregor, but it made sense to to have it somewhere else because if you have it in the same document, it just means that you know just by looking at one file what's required and what's not, as opposed to having to look at a separate file or documentation file to figure that out. Um, but in terms of downstream usage, I think it made more sense to go about it in this way. Um, so do we do we go for a nested input or do we not? I don't completely understand that second slide about how you can not, how you, if you can have flat, that's much better, but I don't quite understand how you can, yeah. If you've got um, like a two piece with multiple values in, in each one, how does that work? I mean, the, the name would still be unique. So we wouldn't basically document the channels, but just the, the variable names. But yeah, I agree that's probably better to have it nested than the point that Jose actually just made. Yeah, but, it's just a hassle to write those nested <laughs> lists. OK, cool. So are we settled on this? Is the consensus we're sticking with what we're doing currently? Anyone disagree with that? Yeah, I think so. Cool. Uh, so this may be related to what we were just talking about uh, in terms of versioning the containers. I think Steve put a question up on there about um, will the containers be version tagged with the software in the container? Uh, at the moment, we don't have plans to do that. And I guess that starts becoming complicated when you have multi-tool containers as well, because uh, you, I mean, what version tag do you use in that instance? And so I guess bio containers are great for that because it's just one tool, one container, and you can version it. But when things start getting a bit more complicated and you need multi-tool containers, then it's difficult to be consistent with that, um, I would say. And also you would need to track the version of the software in the main script somehow in order to allocate it, the, the container within the main script. You'd need to track it there too, as opposed to abstracting that way away, I guess. Because um, at the moment, the Docker file and the environment file um, deal with the version of the software. Um, so in fact, only the environment file deals with the version of the software. The Docker file just builds the environment. Um, but if, if we want to track the version of the softwares within that environment YAML, then we'd have to somehow include that information in the main script as well um, when we're reference, referencing the container to pull. Um, and I think it's just going to become too much work, to be honest. Thoughts? Hello? Yeah, I'm happy with this proposal. Yeah? OK. I have a side a comment about what you said of, of doing compound modules using more than one tool. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't they be instead of uh, a module like the, the ones that are with a single tool, we can create a, a, a workflow that is, in fact, it's compound of two modules. And this, for instance, will solve the problem with the Docker containers because each of them will actually got the, the container that it's from the, the, the real model. So for instance, if you have, I don't know, some tools and whatever, you will have a workflow that includes the process, uh, some tools and the process uh, the process, whatever, and uh, and each of them will inherit the the Docker file from from the real module. I don't know if I 
I make myself understand. So I guess I guess where this where where we need multi-tool containers is for example. I mean, I guess the, the 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 primed example is where you run say BWA mem and you want to and so by default BWA mem generates okay, okay. files because you right? have to buy yeah 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 exactly and yeah, so yeah, in order, I, in order I didn't remember of these okay okay yeah and so in order to generate a BAM file you need to pipe that through to SAM tools and if you use a bio container that will only come with BWA um, and so I'm pretty sure they probably would have built multi tool containers to deal with this but it's it's again it's finding it and you know simplicity's sake it's probably easier for us to just build our own. Um, but yeah, in that case, you would need both of them with physically within the same container too. Yeah, yeah, I forgot about these. <laughs> it's the good old Linux pipe. Okay, cool. So we're, we're happy with, with container version tags. Any more questions or comments? Well, if, if we have more time, uh, just to better understand uh, the, the limitations here, uh, can you summarize the the automated build process uh, compared to, let's say, the Docker Hub automated build. Uh, I'm asking because uh, in the Docker Hub con context, I'm, uh, it's pretty clear to me how you can have, uh, obviously not in the, the sort of more complex situation like multi-containers, but uh, you seem to have some, some then some flexibility that you may not have here, and that might have to do with the with the build process. So if you can just give me some indication of how that is done. Yeah. Uh, so what we currently have, we have two different, three different systems actually. <laughs> um, so right now we'll be forgetting modules, just all the DSL1 pipelines we've had up to this point work with Docker Hub. We have a, an environment file and a Docker file. And the Docker file just has Conda in it and it just does Conda run whatever. And so it builds the Conda environment inside the Docker instrument. Into the Docker file is very, very simple. And that builds on Docker Hub, and it's an automated build. So whenever there's a new commit to the pipeline, um, it builds a new one and tags it if it's a release and so on. Um, that's changing in this version of the tools release. So all the new, all the existing pipelines will now build on GitHub Actions. That's because Docker Hub can be very, very slow. You do a release, and it can take like eight, nine hours for a Docker image to appear, which is kind of a hassle. And if you're doing a pull request or a change, it means you have to add the software in one pull request, get it merged, wait a day, come back, and then write the code for it, which is kind of a hassle. So now we're building on GitHub Actions. Um, if, and it only builds if the Docker file or the environment file has changed. And so that means the automated tests run with the updated software. So you can do it all in one pull request. And the build works in about 10 minutes, uh, and then pushes to Docker Hub. So the Docker Hub images are exactly the same. It's just the build that's happening on GitHub Actions, and it's much, much faster. And we can all do it. We can test it in the same PR. With modules, uh, we're basically taking exactly the same approach. So it builds on Docker on uh, GitHub Actions if the Docker file or the environment file has changed. Um, but we've also tweaked it that we've dropped Docker Hub completely, because uh, GitHub now has a, a Docker um, image repository. So if you look at the NFCore modules repo, you'll see that it's got all the different Docker images which are hosted there. I think there's just one at the moment, Leo Michaels. Um, it doesn't really make any difference. It just means the Docker address is different, but it means everything, the modules, is all in one repo. So you don't have to go fishing around for it. And the NFCore admins don't have to go and make new Docker repositories for stuff. Does that explain how it works currently? Yeah, yeah, that's, that, that's, that's very good. And um... Yeah, as I said, I've, I mean, I've, I've noticed uh, the, the Docker builds on the in the uh, in on the GitHub actions. Um, you also mentioned, uh, or maybe it was Harshal, uh, the possible solution to to adding uh, tools like some tools to uh, to buy containers. Um, can you elaborate, yeah. or is that? I haven't tried this myself, and Harshal's left. <laughs> um, and I can't remember how this is done. I think it's done by a pull request to the biocontainers um, repo or something like this. And when it's merged, then it starts to trigger these multi-container images or something like that. I'm not totally sure though, but maybe Harshal can fill us in. And if not, then yeah, hopefully the end tomorrow will come yeah. and explain how this works. Did you hear the question, Harshal? Um, sorry, no, what was it? I, just briefly, layers. How do, they, how do bioconductors multi-software images work? 
how do bioconductors multi software images work? Biocontainers. Biocontainers. Ah. Um, <laughs> to be honest, I haven't absolutely, I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, so I needed one a while back for the NanoSeq pipeline because um, there was a demultiplexing tool that required pigs installed if, to deal with g compression and stuff. And the biocontainer only comes with the tool installs and not, and not with pigs, which would, would help obviously to, to have them both. And so I submitted a pull request to, I think the repository on GitHub was called multi-tool containers or something. Um, but then I, I never heard back. There was a lot of automation going on there. So it frightened me off a little bit, but um, there was lots of bots doing lots of different things. Um, but I didn't actually get a physical response from anyone. So I'm not entirely sure, if I'm being honest, how to build them. I don't know if anyone else has done that. I guess it will be a good opportunity to ask uh, then on Friday because we will have also a talk by Bjorn on on from Biocontainers. So okay. we can definitely ask him then. Yeah, absolutely. I, th I think that when um, Bjorn or, or Biocontainers posted recently about um, comments on Biocontainers and improvements and stuff, and I think we linked him to that PR. So um, yeah, we can definitely ask him on Friday. Cool, thanks. Right, so we're done with container versioning. Genome indices. So um, Maxime and I have been wrestling on GitHub and on Slack and, and all over the place about this. Um, and it's an issue I created a while back, but we, so we have a, an iGenomes config that we ship with the pipeline template, which is a default uh, a config file for reference genomes coming from AWS iGenomes and a lot, in fact, most of the next generation sequencing pipelines we have use this information to pull genome data automatically from AWS iGenomes. So currently there are different ways in which you can actually use the BWA. It's a stage the index is probably the right way of saying it. Um, you have to do it in a particular way, otherwise um, things start breaking on, on AWS and stuff. I think AWS is able to handle globs. Maybe Maxime can, can chime in here as well. Um, so the way that I've traditionally done it um, in the pipelines that I've written is in order to allow for flexibility, whenever I'm creating an index, I just get the prefix, which in this case um, would be genome.fa uh, and I put that in a variable and then when I'm running BWA mem, for example, which requires the directory for the index and also a prefix, I just input that variable into, um, into the command. Maxime does it by um, doing sort of a glob expansion for all of the files in the index that are actually required to be staged to run BWA. Um, but for me, that has, the, the main thing for me with that is that users would have to provide exactly that syntax on the command line to provide their own index. And I've sort of tried to, you know, maybe keep things simpler for the user, arguably, and also not having to type on the command. I think that's probably not an ideal solution. The solution I have is not ideal either because we have to put things in a, in a, in a variable in the context of the main script which is obviously now going to be a problem because we're using um, modules. And so we'd have to pass that also, that same variable to the, to the module file separately. So uh, I'm not saying I've got the ideal solution either, but I think we need to come up with a standardized way of dealing with this. Um, because if different pipelines will be sharing modules, then obviously this will become uh, important in terms of how we, how we structure this information and how we deal with it. So, I was wondering if, if people had any issues and it's a good time to discuss maybe. So Harshal, in case you didn't see it, um, Maxim was mentioning that yes, um, AWS can handle globs, so. Yeah, yeah, I did say that.
So everyone's happy for me and Maxime to wrestle this out then, basically. Yeah, I, I started using gname.fa notation many years ago for the same reason that you said it's easier to specify over the command line. Um, I don't really have a strong opinion on either way. Maxime, go on, make your case. Yes, I unmute myself. So I think, yes, it's nicer if you look at your uh, at your uh, igenome.config file. But when you look at your code, the stuff you do to get all the other indices from the genome.fa, it's completely terrible. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. I, I, I definitely don't have the ideal solution. I, I, and I completely agree with you. Um, but I'm wondering whether there's another solution in which we can avoid having to provide a list of indices. I guess another thing also is that, I mean, it's not a big deal, but so Bowtie and BWA use the same notation to provide the genome indices. In the way that I've implemented things, which again, isn't ideal, but in the way that I've implemented things by just using the suffix of the index, you can use the same code for BWA and for Bowtie. Whereas with, with this, you would have to explicitly provide separate um, extensions as well for BWA, Bowtie, or for whatever other um, genome, you know, aligner that you have. Sorry, I need to get that. My gut feeling for this one is that only really Harshaw and Maxime have strong opinions and no one else does. Yes, um, I, so. I, I think I'm, I'm like uh, very like strongly um, keen on my option because for me, yes, you just de de you just de um, design the indices like the extensions that you need for your indices and that's all. You don't have to do any uh, trick to get the right stuff because you get the right stuff already from start. And I don't think it's that much of an assault just to decide of which extension you did for your indices. I might just use the time for a flip and comment that uh, it might be time for someone to update BWA to index on the fly. Uh, we uh, we already do that also with Insarec, but. Since it takes time to index to, to do the BWA making index, uh, we also provide the possibility to specify the BWA indices. So basically, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, that, that's, that's sort of what I meant is that the BWA indexing is, is ridiculously slow, it's mm -hmm. not parallelized. So, yeah. One only other thing which is maybe relevant to this is um, that we're hoping to add support for RefGenie. Um, in the near future. RefGenie is a management tool for your reference indices, and we're basically, I'm hoping that we can kill AWS on genomes, um, is my hope. Uh, it's a separate command line tool, but we're going to write integration into NF Core. Um, and then you'll do RefGenie pull BWA, and it will basically write an iGenomes config file for you that NextFlow will be able to consume and use automatically. So my hope is that gone will be the days of having to write minus minus BWA anything. That everyone will just use RefGenie to manage all the references and everything will just be done programmatically via files and then it doesn't really matter which one we do. In mm -hmm. which case, the glob is probably better because it's more explicit and if you're not actually typing this on the command line, there isn't much advantage to doing the, uh, the hash as approach. But none of that exists yet. And it would also require everyone basically to use RefGenie or write everything in config files manually. Yeah, fine. Yes, and also, also for me, one more point towards the GLOB approach is in Sarek, we already use GLOB for uh, several uh, other options that use at least two uh, VCF files. For example, for non indels we have two index files, so we use GLOB already for that. And I know it's, for me, it's much easier just to decide what I want beforehand and then don't write, don't need to write anything fancy in the code. Okay, cool. All right, I concede. Um, so what we will need to do is, in that case, uh, I guess it would be nice if we can update the iGenomes config before we do the tools release um, to 
uh, use this glob for all of the BWA and bow tie indices that we have in there. Uh, mm -hmm. And that way, with the next sync, if people decide to use modules, then all of that code will still work, I guess, because the, this will be dependent, obviously, on the IGNums config as well, once we start porting pipelines to DSL2. Yes, right? I see. So we'd need to change the IGNums config in the, in the pipeline template to, to add in these, um, these globs where appropriate for BWA and Bowtie2. For star, I don't think it matters as much, does it? Star just uses one file or something. Is that right? Yeah, directory. Yeah, okay, cool. If so we're gonna, what only thing I would say is that if we're using the ref gene integration as an argument for doing it one way or another, maybe we hold off until the ref gene integration is actually done. Because <laughs> uh, I'm not 100% certain on how that's gonna work with stuff like the instance. Yeah, no, I think I think this is more relevant now because we're moving to DSL2. And so whatever approach we decide to use with, say, I don't know, with, uh, you know, a module that we have for BWA MEM, it will be staging the indices in a particular way in one place on NFCore modules. And so all the pipelines will have to provide the input in that format. And so I think we need to we need to get this right sooner rather than later just to be able to deal with DSL2, to be honest. Um, and so, yeah, maybe we need to just update the IGNums config to deal with that. And then any any pipeline that, you know, that is, is now being implemented in DSL2 will be pulling the files in the right way and providing the inputs in the right way and so on. Yes, we're currently trying to do that within Sarek. So we managed to have a BWA uh, MEM2 index process that works well. Uh, without any issue. I haven't tried yet if it works uh, gathering the BWA indices that I already have done, but I'm pretty sure it will work as, as well. Okay, cool. So so maybe, I mean, you're using different config files though, aren't you in Sarek for Gmail? Yes. So maybe we, yeah, we need to roll this out to in the IGNums config for the pipeline template. So when all the other pipelines get synced through the automated syncing, then this gets updated there too and so everyone's on the same page if they want to switch to dsl2 everything's in place for them to do that mm. yeah good cool okay so uh i don't is paolo on so i think paolo wrote yesterday that he wouldn't be able to join us for this session in the end so ah, okay cool without him all right so maybe we can discuss amongst us then uh so this, I think, is, for me, the single most important thing with modules is, in terms of how we implement it, how do we provide parameters that are specific to the scope of the module itself? Um, and from what I have figured out, there are two ways. So there's either where you can physically provide um, a parameter, which is specific to the scope of that module and can be overwritten, um, by the main script, uh, or you provide it as an input. So you can see here I've commented out two lines. One is either providing it as a parameter, which you can then overwrite using something like add params here when you're including the module. But the problem with that is if you start now dealing with workflows, and for example, say you need to sort a BAM file in multiple places, then you know, how would you overwrite these values in that instance? How would you publish these files to different places? Because you're, you'd only be including them in one place for the sub workflow and then using sort BAM, say for example, in, in multiple places in your main script. So how would you customize that when you invoke it multiple times? Maybe part of this is just me not understanding how to do it. Um, I had a brief chat with Felix yesterday who said just um, brute force the approach and call things, I don't know, include something underscore one and underscore two or underscore I'm using it for fast QC and underscore I'm using it now for mark duplicates um, and then have a separate add params definition for each of those. But that just seems a bit messy to me. And I was wondering um, if there were other options that were available to us to, to deal with this. Well, I thought that you had to do that anyway, because I think you cannot reuse an imported process in different places. 
I was going to say exactly the same thing. I thought we had to import it multiple times if you want to use it multiple times. But, but yeah. the problem with the adparam stuff is that maybe then you have to, in, to put the includes in, in different parts of the workflow. I mean, that for, because you don't still have the, the, the variable set to, to put it at the beginning or something like this. But Yeah, but you see, this is, this is what, this is where things start getting complicated because when you start dealing with sub workflows, you, so you only have to include the same module more than once if you're using it in the same context or in the same workflow context, right? With sub workflows, that sort of throws things out the window a little bit because you can you can use a you can create a sub workflow to do something very minimal like sorting a BAM file, for example, but then import that sub workflow into one that is doing the alignment. So BWA mem, once it's done the mapping, you sort the BAM file, that's its own workflow. Then you've got another workflow where you're say, for example, marking duplicates, and then you want to sort the BAM file after that. And so now you've got another sub workflow to deal with that. And because you're using that sub workflow in different contexts, it's okay. But if you see what I mean, when you actually create that sub workflow, you're only importing it once, even though you're using it in different contexts. And then how do you overwrite these specific parameters. So say, for example, I want to put the mark duplicates band file in a different folder, or I want to give it a different suffix or, or something like that. These sort of customizations will need to be able to handle um, because you can't put everything in the same folder and you can't, you know, name all of the files the same either. We'll need some sort of customization to deal with that. And the alternatives seem a bit messy to me, but it's just been tying me in knots trying to figure it out. I'm not sure if I'm making sense. I was actually wondering if we couldn't just have both, like a params and a value, because for some parameters, you might need it on a per file basis. So for each file, you want to specify a different name or whatever parameter you're carrying along with it. And some things you might want, might want to configure globally without having to build a separate channel for it. And then just in the end, concatenate both variables. Yeah, I think these things can start getting very large very quickly in terms of input definitions and stuff. Um, also, we have to remember that optional inputs are a bit tricky at the moment. So, um, you know, we could have one input just for, you know, SAM tool sort args like I have here. We could have another one for, um, you know, the output directory or published here. We could have another one for, for suffix, which I've used here in the in the script section, which basically allows you to customize how you call your BAM file. Um, but it could get it could get out of control quite quickly, which is why I was wondering whether there's a there's a more clever way, or if anyone's experienced a more, you know, a nicer way to do this. And there was this map that Paolo mentioned yesterday that you just specify one variable that's actually a dictionary of parameters. Yeah, yeah I, so I, I, was, I was sort of getting there. Um, so I may not understand the, you know, the, the, the use cases for modules that I haven't tried them much recently. So, so things have changed. Uh, but uh, yes, whether you could have a generic metadata map or, you know, input map where you, you where perhaps then you could stick to the um uh, to the same you know to the to the terminology used for variables uh elsewhere so you know published here and so on and yeah so you so you, so you give a single map as a as an out as an input uh yeah so i did think about that and initially i thought it would be nice to somehow collate the sample metadata in that so in this case um, we could collapse um, sort of, we'd have a meta sort of map for sample name and, and another one that would be whether the sample single end or not, um, and then pass that to this. So we don't have to explicitly have a single end there. And it also leans, it lends itself to be a bit, bit more flexible that way in terms of providing sort of sample meta information. Um, but for, for things like, you know, argument suffix, um, where you want to publish it would be amazing to have a map, but how would you then provide that information? How would the user provide that information on the command line? So say, you know, they want to overwrite the information in this map. You'd, you'd have to initialize these maps all over the place in the main script 
um, to default null value somehow. So is there a clever way to, to do that, you know, across, you know, numerous tools where you can overwrite this thing all the way from the command line, if you see what I mean? Yeah, it can easily get, get ugly and uh, with, you know, as you say, a lot of initializations. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, yeah, a lot of defaults and so on. Exactly. Although you could, although you could have a predefined uh, default map within the, within the module and, uh, you know, combine the maps or override the map with, with the, with the content of the incoming one uh, to only override, you know, what's, what's, what's set to a different value then. Um, yeah, because you'd have to, you'd have to somehow within the script assign um, whatever the user is specified. So, I mean, some of these things the user won't want to change, right? So for example, the, the develop, pipeline developer will decide where to publish the output files majority of the time. Um, other than params the outdoor, which outdoor, which is quite a standard parameter, um, what they want to publish. So what we've used here is params publish underscore results. Um, the idea behind that, Gregor came up with, was that we, the pipeline developer, would have a default, or this module, in fact, would have a default set of files that it would publish. But if um, if the user didn't want them to be written, then they could set that to none. Right. Um, yeah. Or you know, the same way as you said, publish there to now. Yeah. The same way. Yeah. So, so some of these will require, or we we would like the the user to have control over. Uh, some of them not. Um, and so, how we pass these user defined parameters into those maps is, I guess, where things get tricky. Um, on in scale, you know, for a few modules, it's fine, but when you start doing things in mass is where things become tricky. But wouldn't that somehow be have to be handled by the pipeline anyway? I mean, if you import the same module twice, you couldn't use the SEM tool sort arcs on the common line anymore anyway, because the it the pipeline wouldn't know to which module this extra arguments should go to. Uh, well, the assumption there would be that whatever additional arguments would be applied to all SEM tool sort calls. Um, I mean, trying to assign different arguments to different calls of that within the same pipeline, it, it would be a nightmare, I think. But it, I mean, central sort is probably a, a bad example, but it, yeah. it could be that you have used the same module at different places with different options. And then it would be up to the pipeline developer to expose a parameter to the, the end user that can set the parameters to one of the two modules. Yeah, and then that's, and that's I'm actually good. not even sure if you wanted to have that for any module that the user can override the parameters from the command line directly without that the pipeline developer intends that. Yeah, so that's, I guess that's where things become tricky. Um, in that, you know, in order to make things flexible, we we leave this up to the developers. Um, and I think it definitely makes sense doing it this way because, um, you know, even across NF core, we'll have, you know, SAM tools being called in, in 10 different ways and different people have different preferences. Um, the same with BWA mem, for example. Um, so for us in terms of maintenance it, and, and less work, it makes sense doing it this way, but yes, I agree. So maybe, I don't know, at, you know, if in that instance, the, the pipeline developer wants to give the user different options to use, then they have to somehow provide the parameters for that to overwrite. But I'm still trying to figure out in my head how this whole map approach would work in scale. So I think the, the map approach should be fairly straightforward for the, for the some of the basics, the sort of next row layer of stuff here, like the publish there and so on. As for the, the two parameters, themselves i think it's best to to have the the module only uh, as i think discussed as well uh, uh, deal with the with what's required exclusively and then you know and only have a you know a whole poking hole to to pass any other arguments um, 
whether you know for a dedicated uh, params, you know, map, map, let's say meta dot params or something like that, as a as a one big string of whatever else that is being used in the uh, in the actual workflow. Yeah. Okay, so I guess with this, we we need to come up with implementations for this. Um, it didn't seem like there was. So I asked Paolo yesterday. It didn't seem like there's an obvious way to deal with this. The only um, sort of tip that I got from him was that map approach where you can, you know, supply a map as an input to, um, to a process and then extract out fields that you would have in that map or in it already initialized in that map within the module context. Um, so I think we need to come up with ways of dealing with all of this, because again, this, all of this syntax will change if we're pulling in sort of settings from a map and stuff. Um, I mean, in the bigger picture, if you if you combine the the idea of the schema that that you have introduced and uh, and and maybe the idea of the maps, you could imagine things as complex as you want that can be grabbed as uh, as an overall pipeline definition. Um, I mean, probably we really need to hear from Paolo about what is actually possible um, but in in terms of stepping stones maybe at the beginning we could keep seeing things as simple as possible because i mean obviously here there's a struggle between having a community pipeline where you want to address a high level of customization because then you want to make it possible for everybody to use it in the most flexible way and then on the other side you have the more customization you introduce, the more you, you make these uh, setting modules difficult, of course. So, you know, I, maybe in the beginning, we could, we could have a minimal version where we, we try to make these problems as, as, as minor as possible We're using less customized parameters. And then when we have clarified the mapping thing, we could see that combined with it with a json schema for the whole pipeline yeah so i think we're i think we already are doing things quite minimally to be honest i mean we we're not doing much we're, we're adding so in this instance we're only adding i think three or maybe four parameters to to the module file but those i think are quite essential to allow people to reuse the same module across pipelines um, we stripped out most of the complexity actually would have been taken out from um, all of this custom parameter evaluation and, and all of the other things that are quite, you know, that happen within individual pipelines. We've stripped all of that out by, you know, just saying, deal with the inputs and outputs and give me an argument string for the rest of the parameters. Um, the other things like published and suffix and stuff, I think are quite minimal already. We just need to provide, we just need to figure out a way of getting, you know, setting them from within the pipeline, main pipeline context. Um, yeah. So probably, I agree with exactly, entirely with what you said. And uh, I would probably say that uh, the, the map would be a good place to start to, to play around and, and give it a go. Um, I'm using in my pipeline, I, I tend to use uh, maps everywhere essentially uh, passing them through the pipeline from top to bottom uh, there are some pitfalls there so it's, it's easy to 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 forget about making sure not to modify the map mm. and not to uh, break the cache uh, but yeah but there are you know there's there are big benefits so, so i never care about the file names at all because all the information is carried down through the map through the pipeline by the by the maps I, I agree. It's I, I think it's the best way forward to provide information to the module file because you just have essentially one more input that contains all of the customization for the module that you require. And also the great thing about that is it's flexible for, for future additions and maybe even future removals. Um, you don't have to change module files everywhere. So, for example, if we decide to add another parameter um, to this module file because we think we need it, um, we can just, you know, we can we can add that in the map and 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 let the module file deal with that in you know in whatever way it's, it's definitely a more flexible approach i think um i guess it, like like dsl2 itself and nf core modules we just need to sit down and attempt to impl implement it 
but I think, yeah, it's, it's been useful having this chat so we can figure out um, what the best way to do this is. Um, are there any more comments or thoughts on this? Okay, cool. So what I, I mean, if anyone else is willing to play around with it, it will be really cool as well. We can use, we've got that FastQC module up there. Um, you know, with just a simple test example, attempting to get a map into the process um, that, you know, allow you to overwrite the fields within the module file. That would be really cool. If someone can have a go at that as well. Um, and then maybe we can compare notes, but I'll, I'll see if I can figure this out as well. Um, the next one really was a question for, uh, for Paolo. I think there may be some, some custom published uh, code coming in the next release or soon. Um, and I just wanted to know whether, um, you know, how it would look and whether it's worth us going through all of this effort with published uh, or just waiting until next week, until the next release to, to just use what's in that. Um, but maybe we can take that up with him another time. I'm not sure if, does anyone else know if there's anything coming or we can use to customize inputs and out, sorry, outputs from module files in terms of publishing? No, but I have a related question, if that's okay. Uh, I just remember that uh, you mentioned uh, that you would tend to have a published there for a default one. Uh, for the modules. Um, would, is that for for you in your experience? Because for me, it's, you know, it's sort of maybe sticking to, to the to the default Nexo approach, it seems that the, the default should be not to have the, you know, I tend to not 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 want to publish everything until fairly late in the pipeline. So just floating the idea. I'm not, not saying that, you know, my, this way is better, but just just maybe just challenging a, a bit to to understand better um, well, I, where I, that's coming from. So Gregor came up with this syntax um, when he proposed this. He suggested um, default all and none. Um, so the way that I understood that, I, I I don't know what happened to all. Maybe we decided to chuck that out, and maybe maybe Gregor can can explain that in a minute. But um, what I understood from that is uh, for any given module file you know, whoever submits that module to NFCore modules, there are some obvious things that you would need to output. Um, now, in this case, it's not much of a problem because we're just outputting one BAM file. Um, but you can imagine in some instances, there'll be tools that generate, you know, I don't know, 10 files. Um, and you may not by default want to output all of those, but there might be some important files that you could output. And the way I understood it is that the module file will deal with that logic for you there. The more obvious things that need to be, you know, put in the results directory, it will deal with that for you. But if you decide that you don't want any of it, then you set it to none. And if you decide you want all of it, you set it to all. I don't know if Gregor can expand on that, but that's the way I understood it. Yeah, I think we, we ditched all as a default option, but the module developer is free to add more than none in default if he deems it useful like for instance if you have an alignment tool you might only want to output stats for um, multi qc but in some cases you want to get the bam files as well so that could allow to set multiple flags for a more fine-grained output solution yeah i think we're going to have to throw away some of the custom flags we've been using in nf core um, for a while now like save align intermediates and and all of that because this sort of customization in terms of outputs um is we'll have to go with a more generic approach to deal with that. Um, and, but I think we should, I think we should maybe have default all and none though. Do you not think? Um, probably in most cases, all equals to default anyway. Yeah, but I think default, I think default should be a minimal set of files that you seem are, but that the person that provides the module to NFCore modules deems to be useful files. I think that will offer a bit more flexibility. I and mean, in your case, like you say, you know, if if you don't want to output the BAM file, then you don't output the BAM file, you just output the stats file. Um, and so the default would be to output the stats file only and not the BAM. Do you see what I mean? 
yeah, for the alignment, I think it absolutely makes sense to have more flags than default and none. Question of whether we, whether we need to have all default and none for every single module. Yeah. Unless we just, I mean, we can have just yeah. some logic that says if params dot publish results is in default or none, for example, if you want to output the same things, you can maybe amend the logic that way. Yeah, no, that. it's it's completely fine for me. I think Phil said that he thought that all was too much. And I said, yeah, why not keep it away to keep things simple? Yeah, I think we'll, we will start getting complaints very quickly yeah. about file sizes and results directory sizes if we just output everything. Um, Can I make a, a minor suggestion that we just tweak it slightly? Instead of having all default and none, we have all logs and none, because that's much more explicit. Um, and I imagine it amounts to a similar sort of thing, because that's so, save aligned intermediates. That's all that is, really. It's just saying, do you want the logs or do you want the logs and the files? Um, yeah, just a suggestion. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I guess that where that would break is where where the where a process isn't generating logs, but it's just generating loads of files, and you want to be selective about what you output there. Do you see what I mean? So you're not you're not you're you're using you're using a tool which generates I don't know fifteen CSV files. Um, we have. So we have a fourth option, which is glob, and then you give that a value so that like any output files that match a glob are saved. That's that's a cool option. I like that. And so in a way that links back to the you know the idea of using the, the map for you know for, for customization and uh, or maybe Paula can comment on uh, on something more internal uh, on whether you could pass basically the text flow syntax, oh. or at least the information that you know, the map could contain uh, uh, fields matching uh, the directives or the settings for the directives. So to avoid this, uh, you know, the sort of introducing the new uh, new standards here, but rather just following the the path. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I like having being able to customize which which extensions you output. Um, yes, but I guess from the developer's perspective, um, it will be fine because they know Nextflow and globs and code and stuff. But then again, you know, if the user wants to output specific files, this goes back to providing commands with which are overwriting what the developer's outputting and do we see that as okay or not? The user, sorry, just generally I, I would advocate, I don't know, I'm not sure if we want to give unlimited access to the finest details for the user. I'd be fairly, I know, I know it pollutes the code in the pipeline, but I'd be fairly happy for the pipeline to choose which of these options to open up to the end user. And I think this is quite a good example where you don't necessarily, it's not particularly useful to make that. And, yeah, I, I, really, I really do like the yeah, I agree. Again, I think this could be abstracted by the pipeline developers. So I think the modules should really be designed to work well for the pipeline developers. And then the pipeline developer can decide to expose some options to the end user using yeah. some custom flags. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But we have to design the modules in a way where all of that is possible. Um, I guess, which is, yeah what all this conversation is about. Okay, so what do we go with? We go with default, um, none, all. Oh, sorry, we're chucking default out, aren't we? So what was it? None, all, log, and glob. Or none, all, and glob. I think none, all, and glob is fine, right? On the other hand, I like the idea to have an option for the module developer to predefine some files that are useful. But maybe we can keep that for later. Yeah, I mean, I I quite like that as well. But yeah, I for think, now, I think the module developer can do that with a glob, right? So if you, you can still keep save save aligned intermediates or whatever, and then you just make the glob like star dot or 
Yeah, actually, good point. That would be for the pipeline developer, not for the module developer, right? So the glob would be an option where just the, the pipeline developer that uses the module can just pass a pattern of files he wants to publish. But what if by, <laughs> what if by default in the module file there's a glob? Ah, yeah, that could work. Yeah, let's do it that way. Right. So if if by default in the module file we provide a glob as what to output, that would be your default. Um, alternatively, if you can overwrite that, um, or you can um, you can output everything or nothing. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Cool. Nice. Um, anything else? Yeah. No. Uh, labels. How are we going to deal with labels in module files? Actually, Paolo is here, by the way. I think as far as I've seen, so we could move on to the hardcore next flow stuff. Paolo. Hi. Bonjour. About what? Label. <laughs> yes. What are we doing with labels, Paolo? Yeah, the idea of you know, label is to use to categorize the search requirement. Uh, without having to specify for each <clears throat> for each uh, process, no. Yeah, exactly. So how? Um, so we're we're basically coming up with with ways, obviously, to to make NF core modules as generic and usable and you know as as useful as possible. And um, so these sort of things now, where you know with DSL one haven't been an issue. Everything's been in the main script. And so, for example, label in this case is just saying. So NF core pipelines themselves come with a base config that defines um, uh, resource usage, like low, medium, and high. And so in this case, I'm just providing one of those labels to this process and saying, give me medium resources and you know, not having to provide it in every module file. So how do you, how do you think we should deal with that in NF core modules um, on a more sort of granular and remote type basis? Uh, difficult to, to find a general solution for this thing because <clears throat> because uh, in principle one could say that uh, uh, you could define I don't know low memory and for example large memory. The problem then you are deploying these many different systems that is difficult to to find a a concrete value that works everywhere. So, hmm. I mean, I, um, yeah. I, hmm. uh, you could try to this thing, yes, somehow to have a uh, low resource requirement, a high, and then <clears throat> use the configuration file to adapt to any to different configuration. I mean, so what 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 we could do, um, rather selfishly, is is say that anyone that using NF core configs. I mean, if if this label doesn't exist, nothing will happen, right? Yeah, you okay. can put that, uh, but if you're not using the, the configuration file, they are ignored. So may, maybe the solution is we we just add in labels as we would normally with NF core pipelines into modules, and um, if it's not coming from an NF core pipeline, it won't be a problem because it's defined. Um, it, it's it's not defined in whatever setup you're using. Uh, but you you can define them. Yeah, exactly. If if the configuration is not using the, this label, they are just ignored. Okay. Can they be parameterized? Parameter size. I mean, so to put a param. So that you can put uh, the the label that matches the one that you have in your configuration, meaning that if in your configuration you put a label that is uh, minimum requirements, you pass it to a param to the module, and then you can use this the, the the thing that you have in the configuration. You understand? Uh, no. no. So like like published here, no, that you can put you have params out there, so that label is is said the same way. So you have a params level. And then you will have in your main pipeline, uh, that's, mm, that's it. And no, because this is the other way around. The meaning that the, 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 the idea is that you declare something in the, in the task and then somewhere else you but, use but, the, the, the information. Otherwise, if you, you want to try to parameterize the, the level, 
the thing is that you will know which is your the configuration that you are using and you will know which are the ladders that you, you have in your configuration. So then you can, yeah, I know. Ah, yeah, but you mean, yeah, uh, you will then have to to pass to all the processes, yeah. And I mean, the user can, the user should still be able to overwrite this, I imagine, with their own config, right? So if they, even if we've provided labels here, so process medium, for example, which is a standard NF core um, label, even if we provided this within the module file, if the user wants to override that, they can provide with name, pre-seek and resources in their own config and that should override this. Is that right? Who is the question? So the, the user, so the idea is, okay, fine. We're, we're providing, if we provide these labels by default within the module files on NFCore modules, um, NFCore pipelines themselves are able to deal with this because we have a config file where all of these labels are defined, right? Yes, uh, you should try to have, uh, how to say, uh, an ingenious definition within all models for some, some research, research requirement, and then you can adapt the configuration to this label. Okay. So your label is going to be around for a little while, so we should use it in modules. No, yeah, but now are, are you using them or not? Sorry? Now, are you using label? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, in DSL 1, we use it everywhere. So you can use the same in a manner. What is going to, why you are struggling with this thing with models? What is changing? I uh, know, I'm just, I'm just trying to figure out whether, so NF core modules, the whole idea behind it is that it's a sort of a generic um, repository for hosting modules. And so this is sort of a customization that would just be relevant to NF core pipelines. And so if we're trying to supply these modules to the entire Nextflow community, then, you know, I guess it's just discussing whether mm. we put these- I don't know, I think an excessive abstraction is not useful in this case. Try to, to keep some more consistent in what you want to do. So at least then, then my, my, my view. Okay. I think when, when you try to make things too, too abstract, that is not going to work. Or at least it's going to work, but it adds much more rather than stuff that is not really useful. Okay, cool. So I think maybe we'll just keep the labels in then and, and use what we're doing because it makes sense to do it. So maybe we need to play around with this a little bit more. Yeah, I don't know. If, that, if other people want to use outside line, of course, they're probably not yet. They have to find a, a solution. Yeah. But I think they should be constant in your project. Yeah, I think I think yeah, that's fine. As long as as long as you know whatever, whoever wants to use it outside NF Core can overwrite the resource. Usage. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm, um, I think this is always the always bad bad solution. So to, to be pragmatic to do the, the, the solve the concrete problem. Okay, cool. And since we are already solved, because we are already using, I will continue in the same way. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, the when statement. I've heard mm. you say not to use that. Try, uh, I will try to use uh, as less as possible. Okay, cool. So use if statements instead. Yeah, I think at the beginning it was, seems a good idea, but especially in the, the first generation, I'm now moving to ESL2 to, to, yes, to moving to model this is less, less useful. Okay. And um, so with if statements, uh, so say for, for execution of modules. So say, for example, you have a workflow that is, um, uh, that's got a parameter to, to, run, uh, to skip fast QC, for example, right? Um, as a simple example, would you have to create empty channels everywhere to, to deal with the instance where a module isn't run and your output, you're emitting the value of that particular module? Do you see what I mean? To manage uh, conditional execution, no? Huh? Exactly, conditional execution. Yeah, it should be, it should be possible, it should work, yeah. Yeah, but you'd have to create empty channels, right, to deal yeah, with. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Cool. Um. So this, I think, uh, we've been talking about. It came up yesterday on Slack. Uh. This is a non initial option uh, input. Now, uh, I need to add something to the, the syntax tree to manage this. Yeah. So this, I think, I think this might not even be related to optional input. So this is more to do with 
um, when we, so the way that we've, we're going to go with NF core modules is that the module itself only really deals with the inputs and outputs for simplicity. Um, and the developer of the pipeline, um, and in some instances, the user can override those parameters um, to run that particular tool. And it, that just gives us a bit more flexibility. But there will be instances where, for example, that additional parameter string may require having additional input and output files. Um, and for output files, that's not a problem because you can do optional output, but I guess for input files, it is because you can't do optional input, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you provide input files via a string as an input, they won't be staged as a physical file. I was thinking, as a physical file, what do you mean a physical file? Anymore? Yeah, so, so if, you, if we have a generic parameter string, so say for example, we want to run SAM tools, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so SAM tools, you've got BAM input and you've got, sorry, you've got um, maybe FastQC, FastQ input and BAM output. Mm -hmm. So the NF core module will only deal with the input and output of those files. All of the other mm -hmm. arguments that SAM tools can take will come from a parameter string, mm -hmm. right? And in some instances, that parameter string might need to deal with additional input and output files defined in that string. Do you see what I mean? And so that's where things become tricky because you're not correctly staging those files as an input and output, you're providing yeah. them within the string. Yeah, no, files, files have to, has to be passed like, like an inter, uh, input parameter. So yeah. the only way is that. Yeah, so that's that's where it will get tricky. Uh, um, this is why um, there should be a better way in the syntax. The, the only the, the only trick that we have so far is to use a a fake file. Yeah, it's ugly, but it is the only option. What well, it's called no file or something, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've used that. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. It right, must cool. be fixed on next level of this. Okay, all right. So we can we can find a workaround. Um, the main reason I think um, so we've discussed this already in quite some detail now, um, but it'd be good to get your opinion on this, Paolo. So um, we need to be able to provide um, arguments to module files, um, and we're trying to figure out how to do it essentially. So we can either provide it via a params value, like we have at the top, or we can provide it as an optional input as we have at the bottom. So not an optional input, mm -hmm. as, as an additional input argument. Um, model optional model params, you mean, for model you mean all the processes in that model file or a specific task like this case, some tool sort? Okay, so say for example, um, say I create a sub workflow to run sand tool sort, yeah? Um, and so, as you know, sorting BAM files happens in multiple places in the main script, okay? So you've just created one sub workflow to sort the BAM file, and you can reuse that same workflow in multiple places, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't want to, you, there are certain things, wherever you call that, that um, SAM tool sort command in the different places, you may want to give it a different file name here, or you may want to give it a different output directory here, or you may want to give it a different, you know, file, physical file mm -hmm. name, a suffix in this place. So wherever you're, you're dealing with the execution of that particular module, you may want to customize certain aspects of what's happening within the module file itself. So if it is a parameter that apply to a specific invocation, some tools that can change each time that you pull different parts of the pipeline, it should be, a, I think, an input parameter of the, of the, of the process. If there's a general setting that is applied to all some tool runs, I would put like a, a params. You know um, what I mean? Yeah, I think so. So what, the way I, I the way I see that is that you're treating the module as a function, right? 
Because yeah, exactly. In this, yeah. For this reason, since this is now the, you can think basically a process like a, a super function that around your tools. Okay, cool. So what you're doing is you're putting in. And so that is a parameter. It's a parameter in the meaning that needs an input of that function. I would think this way. Yeah. And maybe <clears throat> you could have, um, if you need many of these, not just one or two, you could have uh, just a, uh, uh, an optional, uh, not an optional, a uh, parameter that is, that is a map that you can use to 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 provide any optional parameter. How to say? Imagine that in your input you declare, like in this case, input table val uh, okay, and the, the single end and the, and the path of the bound. And then maybe there is another input, the second one that is a uh, val options. And then the second parameter could be a map that you pass like a name it, uh, a key pair mapping. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so that we discussed. And that would allow you to pass any extra optional, optional parameter. Yeah, we discussed this. Um, as long as they are not files. Yes, exactly. Exactly. That's exactly, I, I think that's the solution we came up with in the end as well, to, to, to somehow implement a map to, to deal with all of this. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, okay. Maybe the simplest thing to do, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Oh, published. Uh, did you did you say that you were you had some 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 fancy plans for this in the next? So minute, published here. What's here? The, the the logic is that um, the plan is to have something much more in general. In the meaning that <clears throat> my idea was that we have to to add next flow a mechanism that allows you to capture the output of any process independently by the process. So separate the couple, the, the output of um, the, the, the output generation, how to say, from the task itself. And since this requires some, some, some work in internet flow, I decided to, to postpone this and continue to use publish D for now. And this is why I removed the that mechanism that I was uh, introduced that was published up in the workflow. Mm -hmm. And then I realized that I had too many limitations. I had this idea to even more decouple these two concepts. So in the future, we will be able to say, I want to take all the output of some, some tools for maybe a sender. So but outside the process. Okay, that's quite cool. Or maybe you can say, I want to capture all the output that have this annotation that is the process name or some other, some other annotation that we will be able to, to put some, somewhere in the process, but separating this part. And since this is a very powerful feature, uh, this will be implemented later. And for now is to have at this, I would say, a trend, uh, transition period in which we just continue to use the, the, the same mechanism like it is now published here. So this is also why I would suggest to not make too abstract you know, using, like I was telling for the labels, just use what you have now. Try to not complicate too much because later we will have a, a more advanced mechanism to manage, manage the output. Okay, cool. That's encouraging. Right. Um, so we dealt with that, 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 and that, and that, and that. Okay, any more questions from anyone else for Paolo while he's here? And any other questions in general or, or discussions around DSL2 that we should maybe, you know, we may have forgotten or, or need to discuss?
Okay. So like Phil said yesterday, either everyone's gone to sleep or everyone's brains hurting. So um, thank you everyone for being on this call. Thank you, Paola, for joining. Um, and yes, I think we've definitely got a clearer idea as to how to move forward with all of this. Um, and yeah, we're, we're all on, um, on Slack, so get involved and, and see you there. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Bye.